welcome to A Word for This Day podcast. I'm Jory Schaefer, the show's host and creator, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you today. Welcome to all you regular listeners. I'm so thankful that you've come back another day, and welcome to anyone who's found us for the first time. It's no accident that you're here today, friends, so please don't run off quite yet. Please stick around and let's see what the Lord has for all of us today. I love being on this journey with you. I love thinking about God's Word with you each day. And I prayed for you this morning as I've begun to record and just ask the Lord to draw you closer to Him and give you more of a desire to know Him and to know His Word. And I pray that you'll be intentional about spending time with Him. And friends, just remember... um, It's not for us to just check a box and say, okay, I've done that Christian thing for the day. I'm good. No, this, there's a purpose in us spending time with him. It's to know him. It's to be changed by him. It's to know what he would have us to do and how he would have us to walk. Um, there's comfort. There's reassurance. There's, um, just so much in this word and uh, it's such a treasure and that just doesn't even begin to explain uh, how wonderful his word is um and you know i was reminded as i was working in um in my bible study in the book of james you know i'm in a little small group um uh, with some precious ladies that we've been in together for 4 or 5 years And let me just pause and say, um, if you can find a group like that, (laughs) even if it's just two or three, some, a group that you will pray for each other, that you will just dig into God's word together. Uh, oh, it's such a blessing, such a blessing. It keeps us accountable and I highly recommend that. I cannot, uh, uh, explain to you all of the depths of the wonderful benefits there are to to gather together with um, uh, precious sisters in Christ and study his word. But um, we have been in the book of James and um, our Bible study takes us all over the word as we study that book so you can see how it fits together. But in one of the lessons, um, we were uh, looking at uh, God's Word and uh, the importance of God's Word. We do that over and over and over again because we mustn't forget it. And one of the references was talking, it was where Jesus was talking about His words. And listen to this. In John chapter 12, verse uh, 46, He says, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in Me will not remain in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him on the last day. Friends, we must know this word, and we can't know it if we just gloss over it. That's why it's so important to read it, to study it. And then if you can understand it enough to live it out and share it, then you have, you know it. And so I just want to encourage you in that today. Uh, Please consider sharing this podcast with your friends, family, neighbors, strangers, just anyone you think may receive a blessing from it and know that I love to hear from you, love to hear what God's doing in your life as you're spending more time with him. Well, our verse for the day for uh, the 18th day of October 2024 comes from the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18, and it reads as follows from the Legacy Standard Bible. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Oh, what was he talking about? And uh, I'm just so excited for us to park here. You know, we were in Hebrews just a few days ago. And so we're back there again. And um, I'm excited for us to uh, think about this wonderful, liberating truth. Um, This is a truth that that devil does not want you to know. 
He wants you to be a slave to your sin. But this word here, this truth that is found in God's word is just such a blessing. And like Jesus said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So um, we are in uh, the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Remember that the New Testament begins with the four Gospels. They tell us the good news of Jesus' earthly ministry and what he did for us. Then it moves to that book of early church history, the book of Acts, and then into Paul's letters, 13 letters written by the Apostle Paul, and then to what are known as the general letters, uh, letters written to men who were not Paul, or written by men who were not Paul, and then the the final book of the New Testament, the New Testament prophecy, the book of Revelation. And so we are in this first of the general letters that we have in our scripture, and it is that book of Hebrews. Now, the interesting thing about Hebrews is we don't know for sure who wrote it. There's lots of opinions about who may have written it, but they're um, is nowhere within the letter itself that tells us for sure, nor uh, in the early church historical writings that, where we can get a definitive um, declaration of who the author of this letter is. Some think it's the Apostle Paul, and while there are some things that sound similar to the way that Paul writes, there are also some that are uh, some ways that are dissimilar. And we have 13 of Paul's letters, and so we have a, a very clear um, clear uh, way to see how he wrote his letters. And, you know, he, he could have written this and just did it a different way, but we don't know that for sure. And so we know that the Holy Spirit inspired this. We know that this is... Um, breathed out by God, and so we know who the ultimate author is, and that's what matters. What we can tell about this writer is that he uh, was a Jew. He understood the Old Testament law, the sacrificial system, the priesthood, but he's also a believer in Christ, and he understood how uh, that fit into God's whole plan. And I love the way that he writes. And he tells us what kind of letter this is and why he wrote it. I'll, and I love it when we can determine that from a, a book or a letter. Um, but if we hop over to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 22, he tells us here at the end of his letter uh, what he was doing. He says, But I urge you, brothers, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Now, I just chuckle to myself every time I hear that written to you briefly, because this is 13 chapters. It is a long letter. Um, but, oh, there's so much here. And it was that word of exhortation and to exhort means to encourage, to spur one on. And often there is the, the positive encouragement, but there are often warnings in exhortations. You know, don't fall into this trap. Make sure you don't do this or that. Keep your eyes steady on uh, what you're supposed to be doing. And we see all of those things in this letter to the Hebrews. This is a very meaty book. And when you start to read it, if you've not um, had a chance to study much of the Old Testament scripture, it can seem a little daunting. But as we keep reading and as we keep studying and as we keep cross-referencing and going back and seeing that this is truly all of God. Uh, whole story for us, um, it begins to um, make sense uh, because the Holy Spirit illuminates this. He helps us to understand. He gives us understanding. He teaches us what we need to know. We don't understand this with our own understanding. That's why very learned people can look at this, and if they don't know Jesus, if they don't have God's Holy Spirit, or the Lord has not opened their eyes to understand it, it will not make sense. Um, and that has been hard for me to understand I, I, at, until I realized that truth, uh, that it's the Holy Spirit that gives us that understanding. It's God who gives us the understanding according to his will, uh, because I would think, how could someone read this and not get it? Um, but some people don't. Their eyes are blinded to the truth because of their disbelief. Um, 
But this writer lays things out in a very straightforward fashion, and I love that. And he starts out in something that he knew would be very important to his fellow Jews. He talks about the prophets. And uh, listen to this. He says, God, having spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days spoke to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power, who having accomplished cleansing for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. He tells us that God, and I was telling the ones to whom he was writing, um, that God used to speak to our forefathers, and even we have this um, in the prophets. That's how he would get a message across. But now it's through his son. It is in his son. And his son has been the one who has uh, come as the perfect sacrifice and has been our cleansing for our sins. The Jews would have known about all these sacrifices because that was part of the law. They would have known the necessity of following the law and doing all the things that the law prescribed in order to have their particular sins atoned for. Um, But this uh, sacrifice, this perfect sacrifice that the writer tells them about in the Lord Jesus would take care of their sins uh, once and for all. It was a one-time sacrifice for all. And we talked about that just about four days ago, and we've talked about it multiple times. And he also talks about um, how Jesus was the one who has been appointed heir of all things. He was there at creation And he is the exact representation of God. And uh, it's just so, so much in the very beginning verses of this uh, letter. Uh, You could just park there for days. But one of the things that, and I've told you this before when we've been in Hebrews, and it's been so helpful for me um, to remember when you think about this letter to the Hebrews throughout the one of the main themes that you will see is that Jesus is better. He's superior in all ways, in all things. He was uh, superior to the angels. He's superior to the to Moses and the law that was given to Moses. He was superior um, the great high priest. He was the uh, greatest, best, perfect sacrifice. He was the mediator of a better covenant. He is better. And you just see that all the way through. And I love that. And I've told you this also before, if you've listened with me, that um, I used to think about Hebrews, really the only thing that I could, there'd be a couple of things that would come to mind if somebody mentioned the book of Hebrews, and that would be that chapter 11, Hall of Fame of Faith. And then also about how God's word is living and active. But, oh, friends, while those things are such blessings and absolute truth, uh, there is so much more in here. And I just love it when we get to spend time. The best news, the heart of the gospel is explained in Hebrews. And that is that Jesus came and he uh, laid his life down for us. He paid the penalty that we owed a holy God for our sins against him. And friends, the fact that it was done once for all, it has been done. It doesn't have to be done over and over again. Is such good news for us. It was done, as we read in Romans, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. This was done before we were even uh, brought into being, even though the Lord knew that we would be brought into being because he created us. He knitted us together in our mother's wombs. And so um, I love it. I love it when we're here. And, you know, we talked about just a few days ago how this writer um, goes stepwise, does a stepwise progression, and he, he talks about uh, the priesthood and how Jesus is uh, from a different priest order, uh, priestly order. He was not from that Levitical priesthood order. Um, when he was born uh, uh, in uh, human form, he came through that lineage of Judah, um, not through the Levites, but he was the 
perfect priest. He is the great high priest. And um, some would say, well, how could that be? Well, it's because he was from a different priestly order, that order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is in introduced all the way back just a little bit about him in Genesis and then we read about it in the Psalms and this writer of the letter to the Hebrews uh, begins to try to explain that and he um, also explains how uh, Jesus is that mediator of the new covenant and he talks how Jesus is the greatest high priest and he's he gives us the explanation and the contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant and then as we get to this chapter 10 how Christ's um, laying down his life his sacrifice was a one time for all sacrifice and um, that he didn't have to do like the uh, the sacrifices prescribed in the law where the same sac- same type of sacrifices were offered over and over again by the Levitical priests for the same sins committed over and over again. No, Jesus's sacrifice was a one-time sacrifice for all people, for all time. And uh, that was the difference. His sacrifice was better. And so I want to back up and read forward to our verse for the day so we get the uh, this reminder again in this context. And uh, it just needs to sink in, friends, because this is, this is the good news. This is the heart of the gospel. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves right with God the Father. Um, We can't be good enough. We can't do enough things. We can't earn it. Our righteousness is because of what Jesus has done and because he covers us. He imparts his righteousness or imputes, as you'll read in some translations, his righteousness on us. It's given. It's grace. It's a gift. We can't earn it. And, oh, I just love that. So let's back up here and we'll read forward to our verse for the day. And just one more thing that I want you to I want to encourage you to think about as we read forward here. Remember, in um, some of the chapters leading up to this, in uh, eight and nine, he the writer had talked about the old covenant and the new covenant. And uh, let me just for a minute tell remind you about that. You know, the old covenant referred to the law, that law that um, God had given Moses to give to the people. He first gave it to them when they were in the wilderness. It was how they were to know that they were set apart. It had the rules and all these things. Well, they kept breaking that. And even all the way back in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, God told them that there was going to be, and I'm paraphrasing this, but you can look at it, and uh, the Hebrew writer is going to quote some of this here in just a few minutes when we read this uh, chapter 10. But the uh, God gave Jeremiah the words to say that, to tell them that there was going to be a new covenant. And it wasn't like the one that their fathers broke. This was a new one, and um, it was going to be for everyone. It was going to be a covenant of forgiveness where he would remember our sins no more. So, um, And then remember that Jesus later talks about this new covenant in his blood uh, when he's having uh, that final supper. And so I just want to frame that for you as we read forward. So if we hop back here at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, it says, For the law since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. And we've talked about that over and over again, friends, that the law itself did not um, make people righteous or cleanse consciousness or cleanse hearts. It was um, it was something that they needed to do. It was a shadow of the things to come, but there was going to be a more perfect thing. And then it says in verse 2, otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered? And he's talking about the sacrifices. Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, so the sacrifices of the bulls and the rams and all those things, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes, and that's talking about Jesus, into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. 
in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first, in order, in other words, the first covenant, in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies are put as a footstool for his feet. Now, let me just pause right here. If you go back and you look at this in your um, translation of God's word, um, you will see, well, if you look in the North... uh, New American Standard, or you look in the Legacy Standard, you will see that those uh, there are parts of those that will be all capitalized, and that's uh, showing us uh, that these are um, quotes of Scripture, uh, quotes of the Old Testament. So the writer of this letter to the Hebrews is pulling out Scripture that the Jews would have known, and he's explaining it. He's uh, explaining what was going on, and so that's what was going on there. And then it says in verse 14, for by one offering, he, Jesus, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And we talked about that four days ago when we did a podcast on that verse. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. I have to pause right there before we get to our verse. That that little section there, he's quoting from Jeremiah 31 when he's talking about that new covenant. And so uh, the writer is saying, now this is what God was talking about when he was talking about this new covenant. And this happened in Jesus And then in our verse, in verse 18 for the day, it says, Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. So what did he mean by that? Well, when he was talking about forgiveness of these things, he's talking about those lawless deeds, the iniquities, the sins. And because there has been full forgiveness there didn't there no longer needed to be another sacrifice and he's contrasting the difference between that old covenant where those same things the grain offerings the sin offerings the guilt offerings the free will offerings were um done over and over and over again but his point here is that with Jesus it was a one time once for all uh, a sacrifice and that once he's done it there, you don't have to keep doing it over and over again. And friends, that is good news for us. And we've talked about this before. That old devil and in the way that he tries to deceive people um, will cause a lot of guilt. He will bring up a lot of guilt such as and, and whisper these words that uh, that thing that you did was too bad. There's no way that God could have really forgiven you for that. And so you may keep going back and, and feeling in bondage and slavery to sin. But friends, if we believe him, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to believe what he has said is true and move forward from that and not going back and continuing to feel that guilt, continuing to um, ask forgiveness for something that he has already forgiven us, for which he has already forgiven us. And um, it, it comes with a mindset, certainly, I think many of us feel sorry about the life or the decisions that we may have made before when we know that that truly disappointed God and it was a... a um, a sin against him. But now that we, now that Jesus has come and he's paid that penalty and he's uh, offered himself for us, um, I, I wonder, and I, 
I just wonder if it hurts the father's heart for us to keep going back and harping on wishing we wouldn't have done things a certain way. We can't go back and change that. What we can do is we can learn from that and move forward and keep our eyes and our hearts and our minds stayed on him. We can thank him that he uh, did die once for all. And that was a good enough sacrifice. It was the best sacrifice for everything. You know, there are people in the world that'll say, well, I just can't change. I just, um, you know, that's just the way I am. Or, um, you know, God made me this way, which um, is just frustrates me to no end when people say that. But when they're trying to justify continuing to live in a sinful, sinful state, If we say that, then we're saying that Jesus' sacrifice is not good enough. And, oh, friends, we don't want to do that. Later over in this same chapter, this writer will talk a little bit more about that. We don't want to take uh, for granted what he's done, and we don't want to trample on what he has done by continuing to willfully sin. Um, And so that's very important for us to remember. I love this, though, in uh, verse 19. He reminds us about the confidence that we have. This is right after our verse for the day. He says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. In other words, if he says that he has forgiven our sins, we must believe that. And like our verse says, where there is forgiveness of these things, when he has forgiven us, there no longer needs to be an additional sacrifice. That's why the performance-based religions, um, some of the religions that say, yes, you can believe in Jesus, but you have to do this, this, and this to be right with him. Anything added to what Jesus has done on the cross is not right, friends. It's Jesus did it once for all, just him. He did it. And and there's nothing else that we can add to that to make it uh, more right or better. And so I encourage you not to listen to the lies of the world. Don't listen to the lies of the devil when he tries to say, well, there's extra things that you have to do to make this up to God. No, you confess your sins. You turn away from your sinful way. You walk in that newness of life only by God's grace and only by what because of what he's done for you. And you believe that what he has done, he, what he said he, is, he was going to do, he has truly done. You trust him and you move forward, continuing to keep your eyes and your heart and your mind stayed on him. May we do that, friends. Blessings to you. Until next time.